So the Brazilian Grand Prix. A nice, tension-building opening 60 laps where Hamilton and Verstappen kept each other honest. And then without any warning, all hell broke loose. The Ferraris drive into each other. Bottas's engine explodes. Gasly in his Toro Rosso in podium contention. Gasly in his Toro Rosso no longer in podium contention. Alex Albon in podium contention. Hamilton drives into Albon. Albon no longer in podium contention. Albon in 15th. Gasly in 2nd place. Hamilton in 3rd place. Hamilton gets a penalty. Sainz in 3rd place. The Alfa Romeos get 4th and 5th. Potential penalties galore. And then I had to take a breath since all of this was too much for my fragile heart to take. Hello and welcome to the TF1 Show's recap of the Brazilian Grand Prix. I'm your host, Tinas Ferreira, and I'm still a bit shell-shocked after having sat through that whole traumatic experience. Now, I mean, watching Verstappen and Hamilton going at it for 60-odd laps was exciting enough, but after all of the ridiculous things that happened thereafter, this race is undoubtedly, I think, one of the best, if not the best, races of, of the year. And we've had some incredible ones, if you think back. Uh, to you know Germany, to Silverstone, to Hungary, to the Austrian Grand Prix. We've just had some brilliant races, but this one I think in terms of pure, you know, unexpected outcomes and crazy events, I think this one is right up there. So let's get into what happened and let's start as per usual with the victors. Now um Max Verstappen and Red Bull were victorious uh, for I think this is now their third victory of the year after winning in Austria and winning in um, in Germany and I think this is definitely a deserved one for from Verstappen's point of view and um, Verstappen got the pole position which was I think a very impressive performance by him he looked on top of things right from the outset he's very comfortable I think at the at this uh, Brazilian Grand Prix at Interlagos at the circuit and he controlled the race he was under some serious pressure from Hamilton throughout especially I think after the first stints he got undercut by Hamilton actually you know after the first round of pit stops but a bit of a mistake by Hamilton with his battery and a good outlap by Verstappen meant that he was able to overtake Hamilton back into first place and it was a bit of a cat and mouse situation between Verstappen and Hamilton the whole race through and then obviously when um the safety car started coming out because of firstly Bottas's engine that broke and then the Ferraris that drove into each other and we'll obviously talk about that a bit later. Verstappen, I think, and, and Red Bull's strategy team handled all of those sort of decisions, I think the best out of all of the teams and then finally eventually led to quite a comfortable victory for Max Verstappen on the day. I think um, overall for Max, I think it's an encouraging result. I don't think we need to read in too much into you know, the result in terms of the overall picking order of the teams. I think Red Bull are very much in the mix as, you know, they were over the the last 10 or so races. So I think, again, a good performance. I think the track suits the car very well. I think the high altitude doesn't suit the Mercedes very well. So, and as we saw with Hamilton and Pierre Gasly, you know, dragging up to the finish line uh, on the final lap, the Honda engine, I think, copes with the higher altitude a bit better than the Mercedes engine. So I think that definitely helped Red Bull and Verstappen today. But not to take anything away from their victory, I think it's a very convincing one. And if they can have a bit more of these in 2020, I think we're on for a really, really fascinating championship fight between Red Bull and Mercedes and then obviously Ferrari. That is if Ferrari's two drivers manage to not uh, drive into each other, of course. Now, I guess we need to talk about the biggest heartbreak probably in my life, probably in this decade, might maybe even in the whole of human history. And that was Alex Albon's very much almost podium. He was 
running in um, in in second place right up and you know i think the second to last lap after driving a good race you know keeping himself in contention obviously got a bit lucky with the first safety car with with Bottas's engine but he drove did a, such a good job to get past Sebastian Vettel uh, on the safety car restart and to take third place behind Hamilton and behind um and behind Verstappen you know it's just i guess one of those things but oh my I, my heart was breaking for for Alex just because you know, he was such a nice guy and I think he was really working towards this first podium and he really put himself in a position to, to get a brilliant result for, for himself and for the team and just the way that it ended up, you know, Hamilton made a bit of a, a lunge there at the end. I think Hamilton should have just waited till the straight. I think he would have gotten past Albon into second place, but Albon did leave the door very open. Hamilton already, he's sewn up the championship, so he was going for break for broke the entire race. And yeah, I mean, it happened. Albon span out. He had to rejoin the track in 15th, and I might have to undergo a year or so as a, some severe psychological counseling because I just felt so bad for the guy. And I think what made it even worse for me was how well he presented himself after after the race he was quite sort of pragmatic he very reflective actually apologetic in a sense where he said that he sort of didn't think Hamilton was going to try it and but he also sort of said no he could have handled the situation better and just I really do hope that things work out for him sooner rather than later because I think he it was just such, such an unlucky thing to happen to him but um, I think, you know, stepping away from from the actual result, we need to look at how Albon did in qualifying as well, I guess. And there, there's definitely some room for improvement for Alex. He qualified in fifth place after allowing for Leclerc's uh, engine penalty. So technically, he qualified in sixth. He was not too far off Bottas and Leclerc's time. So I think... It didn't put. A, it didn't give a bad account of himself. But if you measure how far behind Verstappen he was, I think that's less encouraging for him. Now, obviously, some mitigating circumstances. I think probably Interlagos is Max Verstappen's base track on the calendar. So that's the track where he performs on his at his best. And it was the first time that Albon has ever driven around the track. So I guess that is something you need to take into account. But I don't think Albon will be pleased with his qualifying performance. I don't think he was after listening to him um you know on saturday so i really do hope albon can um step it up a bit more in qualifying let's see in abu dhabi where he has driven before whether he can uh, give a better account of himself on the saturday and i really do hope you can string a good result together in the race and obviously now with the news that albon is confirmed for the season next year so he will be partnering max verstappen in 2020 which I think is the right decision by Red Bull as well. You know, ironically, given the result of today and how what Pierre Gasly was able to do, but I think right result for Red Bull, and I do hope that we can see Albon go from strength to strength. And speaking of Mr. Gasly, let's talk about him and his incredible second place. I mean, who would have thought a few races ago that Pierre Gasly would have been able to you know, never mind get on the podium, but actually score a second place. Now, we have to say that he got a bit lucky. I think probably he was on for a fourth place, you know, not even allowing for the fact that the two Ferraris took each other out and uh, that Valtteri Bottas' engine blew up, obviously. But, you know, you need to put yourself in the position to capitalize on other people's mistakes and other people's misfortunes. And that's exactly what Gasly did. And I think if you look at his race weekend as a whole, he was very much, I think, the standout performer um, of the midfield. He was constantly on the pace. He seemed to be best of the race in terms of race pace throughout. I think, um, you know, he was he qualified in seventh. He was best of the race in the midfield in qualifying. Drove a very, very good race as well. Kept out of trouble. Never put, you know, he didn't put any foot, he didn't put a foot wrong. So... And, you know, such a redemptive story, I guess, for, for Pierre Gasly after being demoted from Red Bull in the, in the middle of the year, after struggling so much with the car and just really sort of languishing 
in you know seventh eighth place in in a car that sh- should be much higher up the grid and i think this shows that gasly is actually a very very handy driver and he does have a lot of talent and a lot of capability and i think it also shows that that red bull car is a very weird car to drive i think it definitely probably requires a very specific driving style something that gasly wasn't able to completely get you know on top of I think Albon is still trying to figure it out, especially in qualifying. In the races, I think he's a bit more on top of things. But yeah, I think the Red Bull obviously isn't the easiest car to understand and sort of just get in and drive. So um, yeah, I think uh, very encouraging for Pierre Gasly. He's going to continue with Toro Rosso next year as well. So you never know. I think it's going to be a long shot given what happened at Red Bull. But if he can continue putting in performances like this, you never know, Gasly might be, you know, back in the top team after a couple of months again. You know, the probation period for, for that second seat at Red Bull never never ends. But, yeah, I think uh, let's just wait and see how it all pans out. Now, Gasly's teammate, Daniel Kvyat, had a bit of an anonymous Grand Prix. Uh, he qualified in 16th, which, if you compare that against Gasly, qualified in 7th uh, is definitely not... Uh, something you want against your against your name. So Kivat will definitely be disappointed with that. And then he got a P10 in the race, so he scored the final point. But, you know, that's after allowing for the fact that two Ferraris retired. Albon got dri- got driven into Vartis's engine blew up. So he basically got four positions for free and he scored the, lo- the final point. So not a great Grand Prix for Kivat. And I think especially given how well Gasly's Grand Prix went... Um, yeah, not a great result, so he'll definitely want to improve on that. And let's move on to our uh, third-placed man and our third-placed team, which is Carlos Sainz and McLaren. Now, for a while, we weren't sure whether this is actually going to be the case because, as I mentioned in the intro, Lewis Hamilton actually finished uh, third on the road, but uh, he got a five-second penalty for his a bit of a for his ambitious move on. On Albon, and that then meant that Carlos Sainz came in third after starting right at the back of the grid in 20th place, which I think is a phenomenal, phenomenal performance by Sainz once again. And people will now come out and say, yes, but you know, Carlos Sainz benefited from the safety car, and you know, he was just very lucky. But you know, if you and I'm going to be honest, it was very difficult to really follow what was going on in the midfield throughout the race with all of the different strategies going on. But science made a one-stop strategy work. He was able to, after the safety car restart, the first one, keep all of the guys on the new tires behind him, even though he was on much, much, much older tires. He didn't drop any positions. He was defending like mad. He was able to conserve enough tires to keep you know, himself at a relative pace at the end of the race. I think that's what a what an incredible performance and result for probably and I think I'm very much now on the brink of saying he was probably going to be my star driver of 2019. I think a well deserved podium for him, a well deserved podium for McLaren. I do feel bad that he wasn't able to celebrate it properly, you know, on the actual podium with the champagne and the music and just just the sort of celebration of it all, but I think they'll take it. I think they're going to be very grateful. This is going to absolutely galvanize the McLaren team. If if they weren't galvanized already, they're going to come back swinging. I have a suspicion next year, and I hope they can start mixing it more and more with with the top three teams. And yeah, what a brilliant, brilliant result for Carlos Sainz and so well-deserved. And um, Lando Norris had a bit of a difficult day um, or a difficult weekend, actually, where... You know, he qualified in 11th. And um, I think, interestingly, I think both McLarens actually struggled at Interlagos throughout with both. I think they they just didn't feel they had the pace or the, the car underneath them. And it sort of showed with Norris's qualifying performance and then also with Norris, you know, ending up 8th on the track. I think they had a few sort of weird strategy decisions. And also some of the tyres just didn't switch on for Norris. And that basically meant that he was struggling throughout but you know some good points scored i guess for lando he'll be disappointed but um i think for the team in general this is still a very very positive result and yeah definitely by far and far away the fourth best team this year so far and i think it's just going to be a bit of a celebrate a celebratory victory 
race for them in Abu Dhabi after a very, very positive year. Now, before we get into the rest of the midfield, I think it's probably fair to just quickly chat about our two other top teams, if you can call it that. So Mercedes and Ferrari. And let's talk about Mercedes first because they had a bit of an interesting weekend where obviously Toto Wolff, the, the team principal, decided not to come to Brazil. And I think in hindsight, he's thinking, you know, maybe you should have made the trip because it was slightly chaotic for Mercedes, I think, throughout. Um, you know, qualifying was okay, I guess, for them with Hamilton qualifying in third and Bottas in fifth, which then meant he started in fourth place after Leclerc's demotion. Now, uh, you know, it was interesting for me, especially in qualifying, that they showed really good pace in, in free practice three, where Hamilton was actually the fastest, and I thought they were going to, you know, probably be able to dominate from the front. And then, all of a sudden, the, tack, the track temperature started cooling down, and all of a sudden, the Mercedes lost its pace, it couldn't switch on the tyres, and then it was a bit of a struggle, I think, for Mercedes. And Hamilton, rightfully, after the qualifying session, said that the third position was the best outcome they could have hoped for, really. They just didn't really have the speed in the conditions um, that they required. So Hamilton, pretty happy with third place. I thought Hamilton was very, very good uh, at the start of the race, where he got a pretty decent start, even, I'd say, compared to Vettel. But he was super late on the brakes on the outside of, of the Senna S's and actually sneaked past or snuck past Sebastian Vettel on the first at the first corner, which then set him up for you know the 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 basically the the boss battle with Ham, with with Verstappen at the front, which I th- I thought was very nice to see. I think Hamilton and Verstappen going toe to toe was fascinating. Hamilton sort of just driving and doing whatever he wanted to basically was entertaining to see. He was driving the strategy calls. He was saying, no, let's do an undercut. Let's do this. Let's do that. And the team was allowing him to. So it was sort of nice to see Hamilton's racing brain working as well. Him taking a bit of, you know, control. And, um, you know, he got ahead once or twice. I think it was close a few times. Uh, I think he was quite upset with his team after the first I think Pitt's round of pit stops where he actually was able to undercut Verstappen and uh, he used up too much of his battery on his uh, on his outlap, which then meant that when Verstappen came out, he wasn't able to uh, defend against Verstappen on the main straight, which then meant Verstappen basically walked past him and back into first place. But um, I think overall a good performance by Hamilton in the race again, right up until things got a bit haywire, you know, during the last 10 laps where after the first safety car, Mercedes decided to basically do the opposite of Verstappen, which then meant that Verstappen pitted and Hamilton stayed out on his old medium tyres. That then meant that Hamilton was a bit of a sitting duck on the restart and Verstappen breezed past once again. I thought Hamilton did a good job, you know, after being passed by Verstappen to actually keep Albon and and Vettel and Leclerc behind him on his much older tyres. But then uh, Leclerc and Vettel quite kindly decided to drive into each other, which then went another safety car came out about, I think it was four or five laps before the end of the race. Now, this is where I was quite surprised um, that Hamilton then decided to go and pit again because that effectively relegated him from second to fourth. Now, Mercedes actually said after the race that they miscalculated, you know, what was going to happen and they thought that Hamilton was going to come out in third behind Albon. But um, they were very much at risk of losing of basically finishing um, behind the safety car with four laps to go and then basically having pitted Hamilton's podium away with him in fourth place. Now, obviously, it didn't transpire like that uh, with with the race being restarted two laps before the end of the race. Now, Hamilton got past Gasly quite quickly and then the fateful crash, the fateful late, um, you know, late lunge into Alex Albon's car which then meant Hamilton had a broken front wing. Gasly got past him as well. Um, Hamilton actually raced Gasly quite competitively, even with you know half of his front wing missing, and was about you know a tenth, half a tenth from um, taking second place at the finish line. But uh, you know Hamilton quite rightly, I think, put his hand up at the end of the race and was very upfront about the fact that he made a mistake and he. You know, it's completely his fault and that he's apologizing to, to Alex. 
and he got a five second penalty for his troubles which then meant Hamilton was actually relegated to seventh place given how closely packed the the cars were right after the safety car restart so I mean it was an entertaining one for Mercedes I think it was very nice to sort of see them just you know throw a caution to the wind and try things with strategy and just you know trying to do interesting things so that was very nice to see for Mercedes not their best race outcome but they've sewn up both of the championships so I guess they're just going to try and maximize now in Abu Dhabi now, Valtteri Bottas, not really much I can say about him. He's been a bit anonymous this weekend. And I think after his very successful outing in, in Austin last week, or not last week, two weeks ago, you probably would have wanted to see a bit more from him. And I think a weekend like this is something that he cannot afford next year if he wants to challenge Hamilton because Hamilton is going to be strong every weekend. There hasn't really been any race weekend that I can think of where Hamilton hasn't been in contention for either a win or a podium. And Bottas can't afford to be off the pace like this where he just sort of languishes in fifth place when for, in fourth place, not really doing anything, just sort of, you know, not trying to go backwards and not actually making any progress. So I think a, probably a relatively poor performance from Bottas and... Um, I think his engine braking was just putting him out of his misery, to be honest. So, yeah, I think let's leave that there. And I guess when you talk about misery, we now, we, we need to talk about Ferrari because, I mean, what what are they doing? I just, I'm I'm speechless. And I, I actually tweeted during the race that what, what happened there was the most Ferrari thing to happen, where they're side by side on the straight and then... Vettel moves, you know, slightly across. And I guess, well, let's, let's before, before I actually describe the incident, let's just give some context. So Vettel was actually, you know, sitting quite nicely in third place after, you know, the round of pit stops and also after the first safety car by Valtteri Bottas, which then obviously bunched everybody up. Now, Charles Leclerc, his teammate, was doing a very good job of fighting his way back after starting in 14th place um, with a um, an engine penalty. So he was running, I think, in 6th place at the time with Albon and in 5th, something like that. Um, but basically, after the round of pit stops and safety cars, Albon was running in 4th, apologies, in 3rd, with, with Vettel and Leclerc in 4th and 5th, respectively, with Leclerc having pitted under the, the, the safety car to put on a fresh new set of tires which were slightly, obviously, a bit a bit newer than, than metals. Now, Ferrari said, listen, the championship is over, so you guys are allowed to race each other, which is fair enough. Um, but then all chaos ensued, with Leclerc trying to overtake Vettel on his new tires on the main straight, managed to do so, Vettel cutting back, and on the next straight, the back straight, basically coming right back past Charles Leclerc. Leclerc sort of trying to... Just give Vettel a car's width uh, on his on his right side. Vettel deciding, no, that's not good enough. After, I think his rear wheel was about in line with Clark's front wheel. Vettel then decided to move, you know, over to the left. And the Clark said, no way, Jose. He will hold station. They had the slightest, slightest of touches. And uh, the Clark's front suspension immediately disintegrated. Vettel got a right rear puncture. And both Ferraris were out of the race. Now, yes, what can you say? So I guess, firstly, it happens, which is probably going to be their main defense. But something like that should not happen in the way it did. I think both drivers were stupid. Uh, Vettel was probably more at fault than the clerk, but I actually agreed with the eventual sort of decision made by the stewards where they said that, you know, no driver was predominantly at fault. And I, I think a lot of people will disagree with me and with the stewards because I think a lot of people feel that Vettel was actually at fault. But I think that Leclerc had a, so much racetrack to his left to drive into or to just sort of use to give Vettel a bit more space. It wasn't necessary for him to cut it that fine. Um, for Leclerc, obviously, was definitely not necessary for Vettel to sort of start moving to the left. But Leclerc, it's not like Leclerc had nowhere to go. And it's also not like it would have really changed his position relative to Vettel. Would have, you know, left him with such a big of a, such big of a disadvantage 
compared to Sebastian Vettel at that stage, given that Vettel was already past basically Leclerc at that stage. So I think Leclerc just wanted to prove a point and not give up the position that easily. I think he wanted to outbreak Vettel at the at you know at the end of the straight and still have a relatively good line going into the you know turn four. And he made the conscious decision to not give Vettel more room than what was required. And Vettel decided that he will do exactly the same and squeeze Leclerc to basically similar to what Leclerc did um, to Hamilton in Monza, I feel, so, which he didn't get penalized for. So I think it was just two drivers being stubborn, two drivers not wanting to yield, two drivers wanting to show that they are, in fact, the prima donna of the Ferrari team. And that basically led to the team's result ending in zero points and egg on all of their faces. And um, this is definitely going to be something that's going to be need to. It's going to have to be very, very well managed by Ferrari and Mattia, but not as especially next year, because I think Vettel is now a bit more comfortable with the car. I think um, you know Leclerc was more comfortable initially, but now Vettel has found his feet. And I think it's now very close again between those two. And I will predict lots and lots of things similar to this if, if Ferrari isn't going to be very careful and is not going to keep a very tight leash on these two because, um, you know, similar to what happened with Hamilton and Rosberg, things can get really ugly really quickly. And um, I thought it was well done by Bonato after the race where he was very calm. He said, listen, obviously very bad thing that happened, but he's not apportioning blame. They will talk about it after the race. Not making a scene, not making a fuss, not apportioning blame. So I think well done by Bonato in terms of sort of crisis management. And I also think uh, they were slightly fortunate that so many things after the accident happened to sort of draw the attention away a bit from from that whole incident. But Ferrari is going to do better. They're going to have to do better, uh, I guess. You know, and it's also... And that's not even talking about, you know... <laughs> sort of the fact that things have been sw- still been swirling around the engine power and the technical directive still going out where Mercedes and Red Bull are still, you know, putting in questions and queries to the FIA around the legality of the Ferrari engine. And then it seemed like the Ferrari engine didn't really have the power um, in qualifying. So it's going to be very interesting to see in Abu Dhabi where they are a bit more straight and it's going to be a bit more of a Ferrari track whether Ferrari's massive engine advantage is going to be back or whether the advantage is going to be smaller. So um, not a great race for Ferrari. I think um, a few question marks over them. Uh, race space still seems to be a bit of a struggle. They were definitely not in the same league as Hamilton and Verstappen up front. So they're going to have to somehow work on improve, you know, work to improve that as well. Um, yeah, they're going to go away leaking their wounds. So let's let's leave that there. Now their sister team, the Alfa Romeos, won an incredible result for them with Raikkonen in fourth place and Giovinazzi in fifth. You know that's an incredible haul of points I think for the team, and it's going to make you know Racing Point and Haas very very sad, and even Renault. Um, you know with a points haul like that, it sort of com- changes the complexion of the constructors' championship for the midfield team. So. That'll be a very welcome result for them, especially after the struggles that they've been having over the past couple of races. Kimi Raikkonen was just a, a war horse during this whole weekend. Drove such a good race after difficult qualifying. I'm very impressed. Well, not that difficult of a qualifying, I guess. But yeah, just Raikkonen putting the car in the right place at the right time. Very similar to what Pierre Gasly did. And Antonio Giovinazzi not making any mistakes. Finally stringing a good result together. Yeah, I just think such an encouraging result for them and well-deserved. Not much more I can say there. Now, Renault had a bit of a struggle, I think, in qualifying. And I think they've been very open about the fact that qualifying has been difficult for them, especially compared to McLaren. But they've typically shown good good speed in the race with, you know, especially Daniel Ricciardo. He came home in sixth place. Um, it's I think it was a bit of a whirlwind for, for both Ricciardo and for Hülkenberg. Um, And as I've mentioned previously, for me to keep track of all of the different things going on with the midfield with strategy, I think, you know, everybody sort of decided to do different things. And then the safety cars and the pit stops. And then I think everybody just sort of ended up in haphazard places at the end of the day, depending on what happened with strategy and how well the safety car played into what the teams are doing. So um, good result for Ricardo in sixth, um, Hulkenberg in 15th. 
he got a time penalty for overtaking um i think for overtaking someone before the start finish straight after the safety car restart which you're not allowed to do so not a great race for hulk but a decent race for ricardo but not a great outcome for Renault, given that Toro Rosso had its second place and that Alfa Romeo has a fourth and a fifth. So that actually means that Renault is, 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 is making a bit of a net loss when it comes to points compared to their competitors. So again, a bit of an opportunity lost for them. And I think they are probably desperate for the season to be over so they can go back and uh, reevaluate things a bit more. Uh, racing points. Not really much I can say there. Perez came home in ninth place. Bit of an anonymous race for Sergio Perez. Um, not a great performance, I'd say. Lance Stroll had a DNF after, I think, a suspension failure with some debris. Um, I think the main thing just to point out here is Lance Stroll went out in Q1 again. So he has to do something about his qualifying pace. And I've said this before in previous episodes, but Lance Stroll needs to address that because... That's not acceptable for you to have such a big deficit to your teammate and to not, you know, put the car in its rightful place with regards to the pecking order, especially in qualifying. Because you can't make so much work for yourself every single race to then catch up and then make up places. And that's just never going to lead to the type of consistent results that you need. So Lance Stroll, I need you to be better. Talking about uh, being better, now, I mean... Let's just talk about Haas and let's say that they are the Formula One racing team equivalent of, I think, like the Bermuda Triangle. Now, the Bermuda Triangle, for those who don't know, is basically a little little area in the, in, the, in the Pacific where, you know, nobody really knows what's going on. All that they know is that for some reasons, you know, airplanes crash and ships disappear and it's just all, you know, very hazy and very very weird in terms of explaining what exactly is going on and what's causing all of these suspicious events if you can call it that and Haas is the Bermuda Triangle of Formula 1 because you can see what's happening each and every race but I mean nobody can explain why it's happening not Haas not the drivers not me not any of the press not any of the other teams I mean, Haas is the biggest enigma and I don't even think Alan Turing would have been able to solve what the hell is going on there because for some unknown reason, all of a sudden they rediscovered their qualifying pace for the first time since Austria, both of the cars at U3 with uh, just incidentally with the Australia specs. In other words, the car that they started the season with in Australia just faster than everybody else, all of a sudden both cars in Q3 and then in the race, the typical thing where they just move backwards for no reason. Um, Magnussen got a bit unlucky with an, an incident with Ricardo, for which Ricardo was actually penalized. But no points again for Haas. Magnussen in 11th, Grosjean in 13th. After both of them finished in Q3, they must be desperate for the season to end because it's just been, it's just been so strange. I mean, they must be the most confused people in the world. Because nobody can understand what that car is doing. And uh, yeah, let's hope for, for their sake that they can figure it out. Lastly, I'll make a quick pit stop at Williams. Uh, George Russell actually close to a point. Uh, he, he came in 12th place. So a good performance, I guess, for them relative to their typical performance. But still very much the, the team bringing up the rear uh, with Robert Kubica in last place as well. So not much to say there, except I really hope that they can do better because I'm starting to worry about George Russell. He is, I think, a guy that can mix with Leclerc, who can mix mix it with Leclerc and Verstappen and Norris and all of those guys, and he is not given the opportunity to. So Toto Wolf needs to make the magic happen and get Russell a better seat if he can't somehow pull Williams up by you know the bootstraps. Alrighty, um, that I guess is my views on, on all of the different teams and all of the different drivers, which then, of course, means we can move to the TF1 Awards. Alright, the Pastor Maldonado Award for Most Dunderheaded Deed. Now, I think the winners are clear, but a very close second has to go to Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes for putting four laps before the end of the race under the safety car to move from second to fourth. 
If the race finished under the safety car, that would have been catastrophic. But it didn't, so no matter. The winners of this award are therefore our two Ferrari drivers who managed to drive into each other on a massive straight with more than enough space for both. They need to do better. The Lewis Hamilton Hashtag Blessed Award has to go to Pierre Gasly. He drove an incredible race, but his second place was absolutely down to Hamilton driving into Albon. But still an amazing outcome for Monsieur Gasly. The Nico Hülkenberg Podium Award for Unluckiest Driver has to go to Alex Albon. My poor heart has so much sorrow for what happened to him, and I truly, truly hope he can bounce back as quickly as possible. Right, so as per tradition, we need to ask ourselves the most important questions that we take away from the race. Will Mattia Bonotto fit both Charles Leclerc and Sebastian Vettel with shock collars in order to keep those two dunderheads in check? Can Christian Horner's love and passion for Verstappen grow even more? Will Pierre Gasly ever recover his voice after all that shouting? Will we ever see Carlos Sainz during a race broadcast? Even when he finished on the podium, I can recall exactly three seconds of Carlos Sainz footage during the entire race. And lastly, will my poor heart ever recover from the heartbreak that was Alex Albon losing his podium? I seriously doubt it. Well, dear friends, we are one race away from the end of the season, and I can't believe that this year went by so quickly. The Brazilian Grand Prix was definitely one of the highlights, and this brings my recap of the race to an end. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe or leave a rating and a comment. You can also follow me on Twitter, where my handle is at TF1Show, or on Instagram, where my handle is at the tf one show And you can please join me for the build-up you know, for the final race in Abu Dhabi in two weeks' time. See you soon. Bye.